Hey friends, thanks for joining me on my channel again today. You're looking at a piece of wormy chestnut. Um, it is a beam, one of a few beams that um, we found up in the attic when we stripped the tin roof off this place where I live at and began the remodeling job. And lo and behold, a lot of the rafters turned out to be wormy chestnut. And so we grabbed them and cleaned them and used them as little accents um, in the main living area. And you're gonna see why this particular piece of wood, the history of this wood is so very important. Grab something to drink, um, put your feet up for a little while and um, enjoy some history. Well, I'm out here up on the mountain with Russ, and this is a tree, a really beautiful tree that's in his front yard. Would you say it's in your front yard? I call it a yard. Most folks would say it's just in a patch of woods. Well, tell me about it. Well, this tree here is a five-year-old that I planted there as a Chest, American chestnut seed or nut, and it's a it's actually a hybrid uh, between the American chestnut and the Chinese chestnut, in the hopes that the resulting tree will have resistance to the fungus that wiped out several billion chestnuts uh, in eastern North America. Um, this tree was uh, provided to me, sold to me, the nut was sold to me by the American Chestnut Foundation, which the headquarters is right here in Asheville, North Carolina, the national headquarters. And they have chapters all over the country, but the American Chestnut, uh, just to give you a little perspective on it, at one time, it was the dominant tree in the Eastern forest. And you can see the massive size of these and trees. The chestnuts virtually every year produce bumper crops of seeds. Mm -hmm. And there are descriptions in the literature of uh, chestnuts on the ground underneath these trees six inches deep. Like a the floor of the forest was covered six yes. inches deep? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Where the trees were. Wow. Course. And <clears throat> can you imagine the abundance and how it was used by turkeys and deer mm -hmm. and squirrels and people? Mm -hmm. And there used to be massive efforts of collecting these sea, these nuts and putting them on freight cars and shipping them up north to the Yankees, <laughs> where, who would like to eat roasted chestnuts. Yeah, yeah, hence that little Christmas song. That's right, hence the little Christmas song. Um, also, a lot of farmers that raise hogs depended upon the chestnut. In the fall, they'd go in and feed their, put their uh, pigs, their hogs in the, under the chestnuts and they would just gorge themselves on chestnuts and they'd fatten up and then they'd take them to market. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I think that uh, most hogs are slaughtered in the, by the country folk in the fall. Because mm -hmm. that, that's when they're nice and fat yep. from, at least it was, when, from chestnuts. But uh, I guess it was the late 1800s that uh, a Chinese chestnut, for ornamental purposes, was brought to the United States and uh, in New York, and uh, it was infected with a fungus that the Chinese chestnut could survive. 
uh, but the ones here the botan the botanist folks will tell you that chestnuts originated in China and spread out from there. And there's a number of different species of chestnuts across the world, but the American chestnut is probably the least resistant to that fungus. And the Chinese chestnut and the Japanese chestnut are probably the most resistant. European chestnut is in between. Yeah. But what happened was, in a period of just a few decades, that fungus spread from New York all the way to the Southern Appalachians, basically the full extent and range of the American chestnut. And it killed the trees by the billion. And you can imagine the impact on the forest of a species suddenly dying that represented 25 to 40% of the forest, the forest yeah. and the effect on people's livelihoods mm -hmm. and most importantly the effect on the ecosystems yep. and the wildlife that depended upon that and uh, when I spoke to you earlier about my forest restoration effort I didn't talk about the chestnut but it was actually the American chestnut that got me interested in doing forest restoration uh, this was before all the other things started dying from exotic things that we've brought in, like yeah. the American beach and the various ashes and uh, the dogwoods. And let's see what else. Anyway, oh, the, the uh, elms, the hemlock, and the hemlocks, yep, the eastern and Carolina hemlocks. In a large portion, we believe, of the eastern forest, the chestnut was. A dominant, the dominant species. In some areas, it was estimated that uh, somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of uh, the forest may have been American chestnut. Uh, this is, we don't really have good quantitative data to uh, know how widespread these high density areas were, but we, uh, the Anecdotal information from naturalists in early years suggests that indeed that was the case, at least in some areas. Uh, one of the interesting and although not unique, unusual features of the American chestnut uh, is that uh, when this fungus attacks and kills the tree, it actually in many cases only kills the upper part of the tree and the roots survive. And uh, the chestnut has the capacity to put out uh, root sprouts, and they do. And uh, the sprouts will live, uh, they're still susceptible to the fungus, <clears throat> but they will live for 10, 12, 15 years sometimes. Uh, don't really know what the maximum is, but, but uh, some of them are probably a little more resistant than others and might live longer. Well, the reason this is, uh, a significant piece of knowledge and uh, actually Laura and I found a dead uh, stem of a sprout that had died that had new sprouts coming out from below it and we took a cross section of it and we had uh, at least 12 <coughs> rings uh, I have to polish that and get a more accurate count but it's at least 12. Yeah check that video out it's it's already posted up if you haven't seen that one it's a short one. And um, the significance of this is that under ideal conditions, and I don't know how ideal conditions are here, but this place here had a lot of chestnuts on it. Uh, <clears throat> under ideal conditions, the chestnuts can begin producing male flowers at age five years and female flowers at age, approximately age seven years. And uh, we know that at least one uh, these sprouts live to be at least 12 years old here. So um, uh, it's entirely possible that we do have some reproduction going. There's still quite a few places here on this property where we see chestnut sprouts. And so it's possible that uh, reproduction is occurring. And uh, <clears throat> But th the way this uh, links in to the... Uh, transgenic program is when we bring the transgenic resistant 
uh, chestnut that is a clone and therefore has no genetic variability. If we have these other trees uh, uh, producing uh, pollen and female flowers uh, that the transgenics, once they get old enough to produce pollen, can pollinate the female flowers on these sprouts and 50% uh, of the seeds resulting from that should be uh, resistant to the fungus. And that's why when we were out there setting up the, the little nurseries or, or planting areas, we had a series of four trees with a space in the center for the transgenic tree to be planted in for that very purpose. Right, and those are 100% American chestnuts that are not resistant to the disease, but the, they were produced uh, from trees that lasted long enough to be fertile before the blight got them. Mm -hmm. and I've seen places where there's four generations of root sprouts next to a big old cypress or a chestnut stump. So, but at a certain point, the life in the root can only produce that for so long and then... Well, I don't know how long they can live. Obviously, they can live a hundred years mm -hmm. because most of these were gone a hundred years ago from this forest here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And those sprouts, I can take you up on the ridge there and show you sprouts in fairly short order. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, they can go a hundred years, but that's just, you know, that's a not much time in the life of a tree like a chestnut. Yeah, there. I mean, because Lists the ones are, in that photograph. Yeah, they have to be hundreds of hundreds years old. Hundreds of years old. Yeah. Oh, wow. But uh, mm -hmm. so American Chestnut Foundation started working on the hybrid with the Chinese chestnut, which was fully resistant to the disease. And the hybrids, they did what's called back crossing, where they'd cross an American and a Chinese, and then that would produce offspring, and then they'd cross another American with the offspring of that, and then they'd cross the American with another offspring of that. They're trying to get it down to like 95% pure American chestnut. Mm -hmm. But with the when you residual that, resistance to to the thing from the Chinese yes. that they have the protective. But not, not yeah. all the offspring get it. Ah, so, okay. you know, I, I don't know the statistics on it, but it would seem to me that the more times you do the back cross, the lower the percentage of mm -hmm. uh, resistant uh, trees you're going to have. And I, I don't know that for a fact, but I, genetics is something I studied way too long ago and I don't understand that relationship but <clears throat> one of the things that has uh, arisen is the, uh, I read recently that the Chinese chestnut did not attain the same stature as the American chestnut. Mm -hmm. American chestnut's a taller bigger tree and one of the things that can be inherited is the ultimate height and diameter of the trees, how long they live as well. And it seems like unlikely that in these forests here that have poplars and, and uh, uh, various other tree maples that will reach 120 feet tall in some instances, uh, that a tree that has a smaller stature as a mature tree is going to have a much more difficult time establishing a place for itself. Mm -hmm. Certainly nothing compared to what the original, the pure American chestnut was able to do. Right. And so to get these reestablished, then they're, they're looking for people who would like to sponsor a tree or, I mean, how do you, how do you get the nuts to grow a tree? Well, I, I call the, American Chestnut Foundation, and actually, the first time I got them, they offered them as an incentive to uh, uh, join, and I 
I took them up on it, and but they were 50 bucks a piece even at that for one of those hybrid nuts. Wow. And that's fine. I gladly paid it, and I bought four, and the one you're looking at out here in front of you is one of those, and that was planted about five years ago in that spot. And I have uh, one other of the original four, and then I've got, uh, let's see. No, I have two other, three others of the original four, four. Actually, originally they were six. Okay. I have three. I have total of four from the original batch, and then I got more, four more seeds, uh, year before last, and planted them in uh, the areas that I'm doing for restoration. Mm -hmm. And I, I really should have talked a little bit about the chestnut in the restoration thing because that was. I have offered this property, and it's in my conservation easement, that if the American Chestnut Foundation wants to come in here and do some test plantings and stuff, they can do that, okay. and I'd love it. I, I, I'd love to do anything I could help to restore, you know, the keystone tree species in the eastern deciduous forest. It, yeah. it's, the uh, importance of that tree cannot be measured. So this is... I mean, we're we're talking about this in North Carolina, but the range of this tree, you know, was pretty much through the Appalachians and all the way up New England, to New and, England. and in parts of the Midwest. Wow. And there are some isolated pockets. I believe there's still some isolated pockets where there's no uh, fungus has gotten to it. Mm -hmm. It's like pockets of trees in the prairies or something. I don't I don't know exactly how it is and and. Uh, What's that guy's name? Doesn't matter. Anyway, there's a famous outdoor author that uh, planted some uh, chestnuts around his cabin. I believe it was in Maine. And I think that's beyond the normal range. Mm -hmm. And uh, they survived and they're doing well. But uh, as far as being a functional component of the ecosystem... Uh, the chestnut is effectively extinct. Yeah. And we'll never get chestnut, good chestnut trees, just out of the root sprouts. And it doesn't appear we'll get them just out of the hybrids. So the State University of New York, a professor there in his group, uh, studied the way that the fungus kills the American chestnut and it does so by producing the fungus produces oxalic acid as it invades the tree and the Chinese chestnut was resistant to that somehow but uh, it kills the entire upper part of the tree mm -hmm. on the American chestnut. And what, what, uh, what they have done is they found an, a gene in, of all things, wheat huh. that inhibits the production of oxalic acid. And these uh, scientists took embryos of pure American chestnuts and grafted this gene to them. And lo and behold, it produced a tree that was resistant to the chestnut blight. Wow. And they've got, they've done work on this. This is, they've been working on this for 20 years or so. And they've, they've got the thing perfected pretty much. Uh, but it seems that the offspring of two of those resistant chestnut trees will produce young chestnuts that still retain that gene. So uh, this is kind of the silver bullet that we've all been looking for. And I know some people are very concerned about splicing genes into things and turning them loose into the wild. 
<laughs> well, and yeah, I think, there is that. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that the way it's done for agriculture, this, uh, these seeds of soybeans and whatever that are... Uh, right, we're making them, quote, Roundup resistant, yes, which is that, not a great plan. We're making them Roundup resistant, which means they can spray Roundup willy-nilly and all the native stuff around the fields gets killed gets out. killed off and it's why we're having a crisis with our pollinators right now yep. is that kind of thinking and that kind of activity and it can only be regulated so much given the uh, lack of will on the part of some parts of the government to make it really safe and enforce the regulations and the widespread use that's being made of this stuff but anyway, this is an example of uh, how an organism with a gene grafted from another organism could actually benefit the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And given that this, this gene is not only found in wheat, it's found in some other species too. So it, it occurs in nature and it's a normal process that occurs in nature. And all this gene, the entire effect of this gene. Okay, we're, we're gonna stop for the moment because okay. there's a low flying plane, hold on. The effect of this gene is only to inhibit the production of oxalic acid, or in some way it protects the chestnut from the oxalic acid, but that's the only effect of this gene. And this is where we have a chance to restore essentially a pure American chestnut mm. plus this little gene to its original range and its original grandeur and all the benefits that the ecosystem and people accrued yeah. from the American chestnut. And this is the start. And the State University of New York, uh, that professor and his research group have submitted a petition to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, let's see, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS. <laughs> and funny. they have to, uh, the petition is to allow this tree to be released into the wild mm -hmm. and therefore restored to its original range over time. And there's been a lot of a huge amount of support for this idea. There was a public comment period when that petition went in and I wrote letters and I know a lot of people that wrote letters with full-throated support for this uh, petition to be approved. And uh, there were certainly those that are just totally against any kind of gene splicing as it relates to uh, uh, releasing things into the wild and I can understand that but I think this is one case that it's well justified and the odds of something really bad going wrong seem exceptionally small uh, nobody's been able to figure out what that might be we're not talking about Franken tree or anything like that <laughs> yeah um, you know, the fact that this tree was 25% of the forest and in some areas 40% developed this huge size and produced these massive crops of seeds. If we could have that in our forests again, I would say it's well worth this tiny risk of, uh, of doing this, what I think is a tiny risk. But the APHIS has uh, gone the next step. So they're basically showing that, yeah, they're interested in this. Mm -hmm. They didn't just say no. And so <clears throat> now there is an environmental impact statement process uh, that's starting to examine the environmental impact of... Uh, releasing this tree into the wild and there will be a dramatic environmental impact but it'll all be good i think
But at, at the end of this process, right now they're, they've, they've got a call for input on it from the public, but mostly scientists is who they want to talk to about factors that are relevant to assessing the impacts and what, if there's any possible way that they have of assessing the impacts. And so I haven't put out a call for people to write letters because we, they want data and they want studies. Mm -hmm. They don't want people to just be saying, go, 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 let's do this or don't do this. You know, they want studies for and they want studies against. They want to know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the end of that process, the environmental impact statement will be produced and that's when the public will have an opportunity, the public at large, the lay people, folks like me and you, uh, will be able to get our two cents worth in. And uh, I just, as a wildlife biologist for my career, I just hate to see the damage that people have done to the natural habitats. And I would do anything in my power to try to help restore our natural habitats so that humans can live in concert with nature instead of just destroying it. Yeah. So <clears throat> when this all comes about uh, and the EPA issues its environmental impact statement, if they say there's no significant effect and ultimately approve the release of these transgenic, they're called transgenic chestnuts. If they approve the release of these transgenic chestnuts, uh, what will happen then is somebody will come to the fore. I'm assuming they'll be associated with the university in New York and they'll begin producing seeds for distribution. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to get as many of those seeds <laughs> as I can possibly afford. <laughs> yep. And I want to plant them on this property because 500 years from now, I want somebody to be able to come out here and see a tree that's not too different from the ones in that photo that I showed you at the beginning of this. And I'm going to do everything in my power to see that we get to that point. I'm going to need some help. If I paid $50 for a hybrid that may or may not, a, a single hybrid seed that may or may not be uh, resistant, I imagine that a transgenic tree that is certainly resistant is probably going to go for a little more. And yeah. I don't know if it'll come as a nut or as a seedling, but I'm going to make a call and I'm going to give people an opportunity to adopt a chestnut tree. All right. And if you will donate to my effort... Uh, I will plant a chestnut in your name. Oh, cool. And if you want to come see it, I'll show it to you. All right. All right. So I just think <sighs> it's something that desperately needs to be done. And uh, I hope that you folks will support it. And I will let Laura know when the public comment period for the environmental impact statement uh comes out so that you will have an opportunity during the comment period to send in your opinion, pro or con, to releasing this tree into the wild. And I'm really hoping that many of you will take the time to sit down and write a letter. And usually in that process, there is a form on the website, and I'll give the website address when it comes out. There's a form on the website that you can just type your uh, comments in. And anything you can do to help could potentially be a game changer for this whole process. Yeah. I think if they get 85% of the people saying don't do this, they, they may well not do it. Yeah. But if they get 85% saying please do this, yeah. they probably will do it. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the history of this, like I didn't, I mean, I knew about chestnuts, but I had no idea like the forest floor is, you know, that stacked that high with nuts and 
what it actually meant to the economy um, and the livelihoods mm -hmm. and the you know and the the critters in the forest too. Yeah. I mean, just everything is a major food source that's gone. So, wow. Well, well I'm. Go ahead. I was just gonna say. Um, timeline on this do you have a best guesstimate at this point no, i have no idea and i don't know how long it would be if they approved it tomorrow it might be five years before seeds mm -hmm. are available i have no idea mm -hmm. i don't know and i as i learn more i'll pass that on okay to laura and she can let you folks know about it All because right. i think it's something wonderful we could do for the eastern deciduous forest after all the damage we've done to it oh. It's a beautiful tree. So, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this here, but we may come back for additional comments, or it might just be scenes in the next video. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, I this picture uh, is not one that I took. It was taken in approximately 1910, but it is owned by the Forest History Society, and they sold me the rights to make prints of this and the other two smaller pictures that you saw. But uh, they are an important source of historical information on forests in the United States. And without pictures like these, most people have no idea what we have lost. Truly. I will, um, I'll put the link to that you can give me that and sure. I'll, I'll put that below the video so folks can check them out. I also wanted to thank uh, the American Chestnut Foundation. Like I said, they're headquartered right here in Asheville uh, for all that they're doing all across the eastern part of the country to try to uh, help restore the chestnut to its former place ultimately in the forest. Well, thank you, Russ. This is huge, huge project. More, more to be um, discovered and revealed as uh, more details come out about the transgenic tree. And it sounds way better than trying to cross it out and not really knowing if the trees that would result from the nuts that were produced will actually grow to the same height or have, have the same protection that the first crops do, so. There is some thought that the combination of the hybrids and the transgenic trees hybridizing back and forth actually may provide more genetic diversity and increase the Survive. likelihood that it all works. Yeah. But I, I don't understand the genetics of that, but, but there is that thought. Uh -huh. More will be revealed, and as it comes available, I'll be posting more information. Y'all, thanks for joining us on a slightly longer video yet again, but <laughs> well worth it. <laughs> I can talk. Oh, thanks, Russ. Uh -huh.